Um, it's nice to be back. Um, maybe a few of you remember that I have spoken um, here previously. Um, and it was very interesting how that came about. Um, so, um, as I've mentioned, my name's Dennis Archibald. Um, I joined CSR in 1971, along with uh, Brian Nichols and Dave Lucan. Uh, David and I were mechanical engineering cadets, and uh, Brian, I'm sorry to say, was a chemical engineering cadet. Um, so we, um, we all worked for some time with CSR. Myself, I worked for CSR for 25 years. Um, and, and, and David, I think, is quite unique. He, his whole working life was spent with CSR. And I'm sure he's going to tell you. They're all going to tell you a little bit about themselves. Um, in my talk today is a little bit different. I'm, I'm sort of stepping off my previous talk. Um, but I really wanted to uh, focus in my talk um, about how, what a great job CSR did um, with training and developing people. Um, for me, I guess, in, uh, in just thinking about this talk today, that was a theme that I thought um, would be worthwhile just explaining a little bit more. Next slide, please. So, this word retrospective, that was the name of this talk today. I, you know, when you have to get up and talk to a group like this, you're sort of you're casting around, um, how am I going to approach this? And I actually sort of looked at what, what does retrospective mean? It looks, means looking back on or dealing with past events or situations. And um, to me, it's been a really curious exercise, a little bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle. I don't know if anyone's been lucky enough to see Pablo Picasso's famous painting of Guernica, but as a COVID project, um, that kept us amused for many, many hours um, doing that jigsaw puzzle. And if you like doing jigsaw puzzles, um, see me afterwards, I've got it, um, and uh, have a go. It's, um, it was very challenging. But, it, it, you know, in trying to bring my, my memory back to what happened here, you'll see a few photographs. I, I came along before I spoke the first time and I walked around with my camera. And, um, you know, slowly pieces start to come back. Um, at least that was, that was my experience. Um, and that's really been aided, um, that date there, the 5th of March, 2022. Um, David will probably explain that, because uh, he organised that reunion. Um, this is the class of 71. So 50 years later, um, we got together here at Piermont, we did a tour around the site, and then we went and had a very enjoyable function. But um, those are some of the people who came along to that reunion, and all those people worked at CSR, um, in the, in their, were, were trained um, and worked at CSR. So don't bother reading all of that, but that's sort of a, my, my potted history working with um, CSR. I think one of the features with it, about it is that I never really spent more than two or three years doing one job. Um, and I think, every, I think Brian and, and David would probably re, you know, reiterate that, that we would constantly, get, you know, we progressed quite quickly. Um, I guess initially in our, in, for me and my career as an engineer, um, but then ultimately into management positions. And um, I started here, um, like the others, as a company cadet, working in the engineering workshops. And, um, you know, as someone who's 18 years old, you've been through high school, and then suddenly you've got to um, go to university um, and uh, join the working world to do the shop of the system. Um, sort of mixed up in that, um, I had the opportunity to um, work in Malaysia uh, for Bradford Insulation, so we moved from the sugar division over to the building um, division. Um, so that was a great experience, and then back, in, back into sugar. And I finished my career with CSR in Melbourne, uh, managing the Yarrow <coughs> Sugar Refinery. And of all the sugar refineries that, um, that CSR had, there's only two still in operation, that's the Yarraville Refinery in Melbourne, and the, um, the refinery in, uh, in New Zealand at Auckland, the Chelsea refinery. Um, David uh, Bryan was actually the last manager of Piermont Refinery and had the challenge of, um, of closing the refinery and supporting the, the, the people who worked here, 
as they made the, the, tra the transition from working for CSR into their, into their next jobs. Thanks, Dave. So, many of you will know this, but the refinery began operating in 1878 and closed after 114 years. And I can remember the 100 year centenary as, as a young engineer working here. Um, but just keep that in mind, the you know, CSR's operations have been going on here a long time before, this, before um, I, I joined. Um, it employed many generations of Australians and was a base for training engineers and technologists as well as tradespeople. And the apprenticeship system had its origins at this refinery. Um, and much of the sugar refining technology was developed in the research laboratories at Piedmont and then tested itself um, in, in, in this refinery. Um, so there was a sugar refinery, a distillery, um, there was a canine or a building material factory down at that end of the site. Um, there was a transport business that was up on the hill and there were, there were engineering workshops from a, a light machine shop to a heavy machine shop to a fitting shop. And that's where David and I um, started working. We, um, after we went through an induction at head office, um, we came across, we got into some blue overalls and uh, we basically did a mini apprenticeship for two years while we did our first year at university uh, before we then went full time for three years. So, so this journey for me started on this day. I took this photograph um, during the Seven Bridges walk. Um, so my wife and some of my friends are in the foreground there and that sort of brick building, um, many of you well know that, that's the old high pressure boiler station. And one of my first jobs when I started working here um, was in summer carrying the probes up and down around the lift, up onto the roof to measure the emissions from the chimney. So, you know, there's much conversation now that Australia's closing down its um, coal-fired power stations. Well, there was a coal-fired power station and a, a, a turbine house here on this site that um, raised steam, um, we generated our own electricity, not only for the refinery, but for all the other factories here on this site. Um, we had coal coming into that by ship being unloaded. There were coal silos, um, handling system to get it into the bunkers, and then trucks to take the ash away. All of that sort of operated around that space where you can see that brick building, which is now an apartment building. Um, and this is just um, me getting my you know, my bearings after not working here for a long time, um, walk, walking around the site. So up at the end of, of uh, John Street on the corner was where the central laboratories were and probably looking up where you see the Anzac Bridge, up there was where the distillery was perched up on the hill and then up on the left um, was where the, um, originally where the horses were stabled when they used horses to cart all the sugar bags around but ultimately McCaffrey's transport, all the trucks were up on the hill. And this is a shot looking down um, in the entrance where everybody came in here today is just on the right. Um, the distillery would have been on the left. And if you kept on going uh, down Bowman Street to where, I think it's Piedmont Bridge Road at the bottom. Um, sorry? Bank Street. Bank Street, thank you. Um, there's a big, big sandstone cutting there. I used to come to work, um, hop, came in by train, hopped on a bus, used to get off down there where the fish markets originally were and I'd walk up the hill and then into the refinery gates. Except one morning I couldn't do that because it, for some reason there was a massive wall of foam rolling down that street, it was about sort of three metres high. And David can explain what that was. Um, <laughs> And I didn't know that he was at the other end of it, but he can explain what happened. <laughs> and the, um, the lovely uh, brick building that you can see just at the top of those steps was um, where our engineer's offices were on the ground floor. It was adjacent to the, the uh, boiler station. Um, there was a canteen up on the first level. There was an overhead bridge that went from that building across into the, um, the, the packing station. And up on the top there was an auditorium where um, there used to be um, fitness sessions 
and where we, where we would hold meetings. But um, in the morning when I came into work, uh, we'd go up the stairs, our change rooms were up there, we'd sit on the benches, we'd get ready to go off to work, and then the next thing I did as a young engineer was that I'd follow the, the second engineer and, and just keep that in mind. Um, it wasn't called the maintenance engineer, he was called the second engineer. And we didn't have an engineering manager, we had the chief. All right, and all of that is a reflection that um, we had ships coming in here and bringing the, um, uh, the molasses in or the raw sugar or the gypsum that was unloaded on the wharf. And a lot of um, engineers or some of the engineers started their life as marine engineers. And as they um, were married, had kids, they'd ultimately come ashore and get jobs um, in the CSR factories um, throughout Australia. Thanks, Dave. So there's a very common scene here, that photograph that I took was sort of looking out here. Um, and that's a photo that we borrowed from one of the old public publications just sort of showing what it used to be like. And some of those buildings that you can see in that old photograph, um, still it's, it's nice to see that some of the old buildings have been preserved. Um, what's in them now is very different to what was in them then. Um, but you can still see remnants of the history um, in some of the buildings that have been preserved here. David's going to talk about this a little bit more because um, getting back to my theme of, um, of being trained by CSR or in the CSR system, um, not everybody was drawn from Sydney. So CSR cast its net wide and recruited um, cadets from other areas. Um, and the ones, the guys that were out of town came down and were put up in that building, in that hostel building. And I'm sure Dave's going to touch on some of his experiences um, when he lived there at the start of his career. Oh, I must admit I was a little bit envious when I heard some of the things that they got up to. <laughs> <laughs> down, down on the wharf, again, just some evidence of um, what used to happen here with the shipping coming in. It, What's in my mind, numbers may not be exactly correct, but about a quarter of a million tonnes of sugar a year, about a quarter of a million tonnes of gypsum. Um, that gypsum was moved by uh, road haulage from here out to, out to the gypsum factories in, in Sydney. So it was a very, very busy place. And I just, I, love, I put this um, photograph in just to give you some idea of this li living, breathing thing, um, this industrial complex that was here at Piermont. Uh, very distinctive smell, um, you, you know, we, we, as I said, you know, the, you can see over on the left are the coal silos, the power stations touching around it, um, you can see the cranes, but you can see the steam getting let off. For the people who had the misfortune of probably living at Piermont, probably quite noisy at times, if pressure relief valves lifted. Um, and, and Brian's going to touch on you know, some of the reasons why um, we, we ceased operating here as Sydney developed. Um, and you can sort of see the transformation that's happened here on the peninsula. But it was, uh, for many, many years, an integrated industrial complex. So some of you at the back may not be able to read this, but all I was trying to do here was just to um, show what the inputs were. So. Raw sugar was transported down from the uh, mills, northern New South Wales and Queensland by ship. Um, coal came in by um, colliers, was discharged for the power station. Uh, gypsum for the building materials factory. Um, one of the reasons why all of the refineries are located um, on harbours or rivers was we drew water um, for cooling so that we could boil the sugar under vacuum. Um, sugar refining is really about just getting rid of colour. Um, and so we boiled the sugar under vacuum because we could boil it at a lower temperature. And so we used that water in evaporation um, in the pans that boiled the sugar. If you want to go into more detail than that, I've got a mechanical background, ask Brian, he's the chemical engineer. Mm -hmm. um, we need potable water and gas and diesel. And then at the refining process itself, as I said, steam generation, electricity, electrical generation, we had the process itself. We did a lot of packaging here. 
So the full, type, full um, range of retail sugars was packed here, everything from sugar cubes to brown sugar uh, to white sugar in the 1kg and the 2kg bags. Um, and, um, and then obviously we had to maintain the plant and the plant was constantly being upgraded and improved. And Brian's gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Um, the outputs, so the steam and electricity that was generated went up to the distillery and canine factories. Um, uh, bulk refined sugar, the, pack the packaging, so um, there were constant stream of traffic um, through the way bridge here. That's what that, that was, not only the gatehouse, but there were way bridges. Um, one of the things that used to drive me nuts as I got into management was the constant, all the chemical engineers and the chemists wanted to talk about was sugar loss. You know, we weighed, we weighed everything in, weighed the raw sugar that came into the place, we weighed everything out, and that was one of our key performance indicators is how much sugar had we lost. Um, so just this, just this focus on process excellence was also something that we learned um, very early on in our careers. Thanks, David. It's just a, a graphic that I put together just to, I guess, reinforce. Um, there, were, there were three boilers, usually just two operating at any one time. We had the turbo alternators, um, and that supplied steam and electricity to those, those other processes here on the, on the refinery, on the, on the peninsula. <laughs> so, quite an old photograph of um, some apprentices. So the refinery was the cradle of the Australian apprenticeship scheme. And the first CSR apprentice was Alf Robbins in 1890. The engineering workshops commenced operation in 1882. And from 1906 to 1956, um, CSR apprentices who wanted to remain with CSR post their trade continued in-house education with CSR. Now, a lot of the tone of this was set by the people who founded the company. So that by the time we got to 1971, when uh, David, Brian and I joined the company, they had quite a, um, a very well honed process for selecting people and training people. Um, so as I said, um, we were engineering cadets and we, we did a mini apprenticeship. So we were dressed in blue overalls, and our, I don't have it. I should have, have you still got your scrolling block? Absolutely. I should have got you to bring it. So the first thing that we had to do as engineering cadets was make what's called a scribing block. And making a scribing block started with um, a block, a billet of steel, and a hammer and a chisel. And as um, kids straight out of high school, we stood at a workbench for three months, chipping. Right, so we'd have our safety glasses on, we'd have a screen in front of us, and they were conditioning our hands. And we just had to chip this thing roughly square. And our supervisor, I can still remember his name, he was dressed in white overalls, his name was Cliff Clack. <laughs> um, and once we chipped it to his satisfaction, so we had it roughly square, we then progressed to a file. And we'd spend weeks filing it. Um, and then you'd take your block up to Cliff and he'd stand up near the window and he'd get a six inch rule out of his pocket and he'd sort of put it across looking at the light coming through the window and hand it back to us if we hadn't got it close enough. Anyway, you get, you get the picture. Eventually we were allowed close to machines and we started um, using lathes and, and, and other machinery. Um, and that was our job for two years. We progressed around um, that, that workshop complex not only, I guess, getting an understanding of some of the basic uh, processes of fitting and turning, but, but also just learning um, to work with other men. Um, and for me particularly, the others can speak for themselves, I guess just developing some of the other skills that became really important when you start to manage people. Um, yeah, so I've mentioned the marine engineering tradition. Um, and the final thing there, which Dave may touch on, is that even today now there's an engineering apprentices and old boys club um, we have we still have these networks and i can see some past csr employees here in the audience um, C csr treated its people very very well 
So for me, it started with recruitment. I went to Sydney Tech High at Hurstville. Um, I can remember that um, we had an email came out and did a talk to um, guys in, in year 12, but CSR came out and I applied for a, a cadetship. Um, and I went through a selection process. So I got dressed, I had, I had one suit, I got dressed up in my suit and I went into head office. And somebody during that interview process, about three people interviewed me, but somebody said, oh, you're a shoe in because I had a badge on my lapel which had PFA on it. And PFA stood for Presbyterian Fellowship Association. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just interesting because then the next thing, I, you know, I was lucky enough to get selected and we had the induction process and I can still remember turning up probably on my first official day of work again in the same suit and we're over at head office and we've met Sir James Vernon. And you know, we understood that this was a really important occasion and the great man was ushered into the room. But I did a quick straw poll of the, I'm just guessing here, 40 to 60 cadets that were joining in my intake. Only Presbyterians. <laughs> not, not a Roman Catholic amongst them. <laughs> just, just an observation. So from then, you know, training, um, support and education. I mean, we were absolutely blessed. Um, we were paid to go to university. So we, we, um, we did our, completed our first year of engineering over two years. Then the final three years was full time. We were paid while we were studying. Some of us were lucky enough to get Commonwealth scholarships because we got a Commonwealth scholarship. CSR then bought all our textbooks. And in university vacation, we got to go and get experience at the company's factories. So I, I had a stint in one of the building materials factories I had a stint here at the refinery. And then, um, you know, once I, once I graduated, I actually, my first job was here at the refinery um, as the chief engineer's assistant, which basically meant, you know, I was at his beck and call, but I worked very, very closely with um, the second engineer who became a lifelong friend. And uh, I always get emotional, I did last time I gave this talk. He yeah, was a very, very powerful influence on my life. Um, the support in life, I mean, it went as far as um, low-cost loans to buy our first house. So when my wife and I bought our first loan, we, we received, um, I can think I've got this right, $16,000 loan at 4.5% interest over 35 years. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, they wanted to, they're very careful about the people they chose, um, you know, they supported them. Um, mentorship was always available. And then experiences and challenges is what helps you to grow as well. I mean, I, I finished my time with CSR and it was really because things were starting to change, the deregulation was starting to happen. Um, I was in Melbourne. When I went to Melbourne, I knew that I probably had to reduce the workforce by 40 to 50 per cent. One of the first jobs, one of the first questions I was asked when I went there, will there be job losses? And I said, yes. And I said, I'll let you know when I can. Um, and so we went through all of that. Um, we had a six weeks, a six week strike while I was there. Uh, we had a national sugar recall. Um, as I can remember it was a very, very torrid and tough time, but you know, those sort of things toughen you up and give you experiences for the next job. And at that point, um, I don't know how long I went for, but I'm going to hand over to Brian now. Um, thanks, Dennis. Um, it feels like I'm home now. Um, my office, when I worked at Piermont, was just down behind this room. And the union delegates that I used to deal with in an office quite regularly would be very amused to see that there's now a men's toilet right outside. <laughs> <there. laughs> um, but I remember my time at Piedmont with great fondness. It was one of the most enjoyable uh, jobs and times in, in my working career. Um, Dennis said that CSR took people from far and wide. They even took Queenslanders. <laughs> so I met Dave on Roma Street Railway Station, I think, in 1971. We took the overnight train to Sydney and 
soon later I uh, met Dennis and others and uh, now no, you pinch yourself to realise that you've known these people for 50 plus years um, and we've gained lifelong friendships through CSR so that, that's a great part of our lives I think. Just wanted to talk a little bit about the significance of CSR in when we joined and certainly from the period 1950s through to the late 1980s CSR was one of the major companies in Australia um, so it was in probably the top five or the top ten in market capital so we had it along with BHP, Mount Isa Mines, Bank of New South Wales, those sort of companies and CSR was one of the really big um, Australian manufacturers. Um, we probably didn't realise it at the time but when we got a job with CSR as aspiring engineers, we, we literally run Lotto, I think. Um, I then started off at uh, Central Laboratory. So Central Laboratory in the later years was up here in, um, in John Street, just behind us. Um, <coughs> it, it had a strong place in the Australian sugar industry. There was analysis of sugar samples from all around Australia that was controlling the payment for the sugar by the customers and also the payment to the growers. And that was all analysed and done through um, through Central Laboratory in my day and by a bunch of 17 and 18 year olds who had just finished school. So already CSR was showing us if you had good procedures and you trained people well, you could give them very responsible jobs. You had to have managers there to keep an eye on what they were doing, keep an eye out of their shoulder but it was a great training in, in early life. Um, later on I went to uh, New Farm. This photo is not a central laboratory. This is New Farm, the refinery in Brisbane. And the lady in, um, in uh, the middle of the photo, Glenda, was still working there at New Farm and she said to me, well, that's the way you did it at Central Lab, but let me tell you how we do it here at New Farm. <laughs> so, um, just as a couple of other things about a background of CSR. CSR introduced analytical chemistry and scientific manufacturing to Australia way back through the sugar industry, probably more milling than, than the refining initially. Um, and CSR had quite a distinctive personality um, and I think that goes back to in the early days one of the forefathers went back to Europe and said I need to recruit some people who can help me develop this business. And so he came back to Australia, uh, bringing along with him a German engineer and a Scottish accountant. <laughs> and you know, I think you know where this is heading. <laughs> um, so in technical matters, we're so precise, so disciplined, so efficient. And uh, um, in financial matters, deep pockets and short arms. <laughs> um, so I've never heard so many excuses as to why you couldn't spend money. <laughs> and they were just endless. Coming back to Piedmont now, um, sugar refining is, is quite a mature technology. It's been the fundamentally same process has been used for probably more than 100 years. So there's been creeping improvements in sugar refining as you make changes to reduce the energy or make it more efficient, but it's fundamentally the same process, I think it's fair to say. Um, these factories well, sugar is a very major food. Refined <coughs> sugar, I think, the per capita consumption of refined sugar in Australia used to be one kilogram per person per week. Per <laughs> yeah, so, so you people are, and people don't believe that, but when you look at it in baked goods, um, in desserts, in all sorts of foods, it acts as a preservative. So it's used everywhere, and it's still, I think, 700 or 750 grams per person per week in Australia now. Um, so, so it was in this white, pure, crystalline form and it's hard to transport. So they end up establishing sugar refineries in all of the major population centres. So we had them in all the mainland capital cities. Um, all of these old, uh, run-down looking buildings, but they kept the technology updated through the factories. Um, I've seen very similar looking plants in San Francisco, in London, um, in a couple of other major cities in America. So you get this technology that's been running for a long period of time. Um, CSR, do you want to click on CSR spend money, uh, sometimes not as much as we wanted or as quickly as we wanted, but they spend money updating the plant. And so here at Piedmont, um, 
They installed a new granular carbon plant, uh, some computerized process control, which was quite, quite advanced in the late 80s for what was achieved there. Um, and they kept spending money to keep this as an efficient plant. So I don't want you to think that when we closed Piedmont Refinery, it was a heap of bolts. You know, it was still an effective, efficient plant. Obviously, it could have been better, but it was still working very well. Can we click on the next one? Um, so, in CSR had an esteemed place in the, in the International Sugar Refining Organisation, and in 1987, we hosted um, an international conference here at the, in Sydney and did a factory visit to Piedmont. Um, CSR was a leader in some of the technology that was used in sugar refining around the world. Um, but more importantly though, I, I want to talk about um, the refinery as a community. There is a real community here. At, um, there was a large workforce. Um, people had a real sense of belonging. They felt, they felt that the factory belonged to them. It was, do you want to click on the next slide? Now? Um, it was quite a multicultural workforce. Originally, um, we used to call them New Australians. Are you allowed to say that still? Uh, but there was a lot of people who came here from Central Europe and later on from Southeast Asia. Um, the slide shows English language classes in progress that we used to use. Um, there, was a, there was a doctor and a nurse employed on site. Um, there was a gardener. There were a heap of painters. It was a bit like a port under the half bridge. They start at the top, go to the bottom, and then go back and repeat. Um, but more importantly, there was a very active social club. There was regular refinery picnics where people socialised together. You'd get a very good turn up from the workforce. Um, do you want to click along now? Um, there was a lot of uh, loyalty and long serving among the workforce. So this is this is a few of us on the night we were awarded our 20 year service awards. Um, I used to really enjoy the picnics and these uh, sort of dinners because you'd get guys who were giving you a hard time at work. They were telling you that the conditions aren't good or the pay's not good enough or I don't like my boss or something. There was something wrong. You'd go along to these picnics and these functions get a bit of truth serum into them. <laughs> and next thing, the wife or the partner or the husband would say, how much Johnny likes CSR Piedmont? What a great place to work it is. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to turn up at work then the following week and maintain the race. <laughs> it, was, um, it was quite a hierarchical organisation, I think Dennis has alluded to. There was very distinctly uh, wages and, and Staff. There was blue collar and white collar. Uh, there was uh, engineers and production. Um, Dennis has already explained that he doesn't like the uh, production people looking after sugar loss or efficiency. He'd prefer to be um, filing in a piece of steel. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, you know, there was a lot of light-hearted banter and relationship between the engineers and the production people. And there was, but there was good relationships among the people here as well as the community. Um, CSR had a lot of uh, unions here at one stage, I think there were 11 or 12 unions represented. And I know when I got transferred from uh, Yarraville, from the Melbourne refinery back to Sydney, one of my bosses said to me, just don't get lost in the blue pipe. And it was a little bit like that when you were dealing with 12 unions and sometimes they wanted to run their own agenda, so it was a complicated place to get things done. Do you want to go over that? Um, so the, the title on the slide said CSR was a factory. I think that the biggest thing, there was a factory in the wrong place um, with, with the whole background of rapid industry de restructuring going on. So when I say about the, the wrong place, operating a factory this big has a major impact on the local community, no matter how you want to dress it up. So every now and then steam would be released at night time and make noise. There was noise and smells from the factory. Um, there was a uh, large... Can you want to just flick on that, please? There were large transport um, running up and down through the streets of Piermont, Broadway, Altmo, Chippendale. Um, we were also transporting gypsum and things like that. Um, we had trade waste which was going to sewage. Um, 
and I'm told that the um, CAA pilots at the time when they took off from Sydney and took a left turn to go up to Brisbane could tell a little bit from the deep ocean outfall about the colour of the um, trade of the trade race that was coming from CSR's factory. So you know, there was certainly you can't say that these large factories don't have an impact on the community that they're operating in. Um, we took harbour water in as cooling water, and and we had the um, water police doing scuba training at the end of Harris Street. So every now and then when we sent the harbour, the cooling water back into the harbour, there'd be a little bit of froth that go with it or something like that. And so it was uh, my job to go down and explain to the water police that it actually wasn't bad for them. <laughs> I, I eventually worked it out that uh, the best way to explain was to drive the car down on a Friday afternoon to their end of week barbecue with a couple of cases of beer in the, uh, in the boot and they seemed to understand pretty well. <laughs> um, at the same time, there was a really changing uh, gentrification, I guess you would call it, of the, of the area from, from Broadway right down through the Piedmont Peninsula. Um, I was uh, a regular attendee at what was called the Piermont Aldermo Broadway Chippendale Community Consultative Committee. <laughs> I, I think what it was was the uh, CSR whipping boy. <laughs> and, but it was all made good because we'd end up at the fish markets and have a great seafood lunch at the end of every meeting. <laughs> so it wasn't that bad. Um, when it came around, when it came around to the closure, uh, we then had industry deregulation, which was another layer of complexity on top of this. In, in a really simplistic sense, for a long time, if you wanted to buy refined sugar in Australia, you bought it from CSR. CSR was an agent for the Queensland government, and we were taking raw sugar, refining it, and selling it to customers. Um, the industry was deregulated, so suddenly we were faced with competition. We had too much capacity, um, and we were facing new competitors that we had never faced before. So you combine all these factors, and the closure was, uh, if you combine that with the land value, you can imagine what the land value was, even in 1990. Um, you combine it with the land value, and the closure decision in the end was a fairly straightforward decision, I think. Um, next slide, Dave. Um, the first thing that we did, and I shouldn't make too light of it, because there was a lot of work put in by a lot of people, but we transitioned from a refinery here to a distribution depot where on the um, on the, I guess it's the northeastern end of the um, silos. That's uh, where Sugar Australia set up their import and distribution depots. And so that, that brought about the end of sugar refining and packing and all sorts of other activities on this side. Um, but I think the people were the major challenge for us. Um, how do you manage when you've got to give people a couple of years notice that the factory's going to be closing? How do you manage that process? And, and I think that's where we learnt a lot and uh, we, we certainly put a lot of focus into getting that area of it right. Um, we started off uh, with a renegotiation of the redundancy benefits so people understood exactly what they would get and I think that put a lot of um, minds at ease um, and it was a good, good starting point but it, it certainly wasn't the ending point. Do you want to go to the next slide? Yes. Um, when you've got uh, large factories like this, which have some dangerous equipment. Um, safety is obviously of great concern. If people take their eyes off the ball, uh, bad things can happen, terrible things. And so we made safety in the last couple of years a major focus. And we were very proud to say that in the last 12 months before we closed, we had one of the best safety performances of the refinery that it had, had for many, many years. We achieved a high rating through the National Safety Council, um, which was based on having good processes and systems and having a low rate of injury and illness. Um, but things do go wrong, and this photo shows um, the very unusual occasion when the Governor of New South Wales, on behalf of the Royal Humane Society, presented the company with a bronze medallion. Um, and the reason for that was for the rescue of the guy who got trapped in the sugar silo, which you've probably heard about and talked about with Dennis earlier on. So the Royal Humane Society was so impressed with how the company worked together, and there were 30 or 40 of us here on the day, 
to bring to a safe conclusion what could have been a terrible day. Um, and so they come, but, but so, so safety was a big focus of making sure people didn't take their eye off the ball. And fortunately, we got through it successfully. Um, yeah, so next slide, Dave. Um, the other things were outplacement services. So many people, myself included, had probably I probably didn't have much of a resume. I'd only ever had one job interview when I was lucky enough to get a job with CSR. Um, you know, your interview skills, all of that sort of stuff. So we ran workshops for everyone from the managers right down to the shop floor about how do you prepare yourself for that next job. That was very well received by the people who were working here at the time. Um, financial planning was another thing. Um, financial planning, and you can imagine we had a changing environment. It seems like we've always had a changing environment with superannuation, but people were starting to accumulate superannuation. They were getting redundancy payments. They had to work out what to do with all of that as they transitioned their life. It might have been either to retirement or it might have been to another job. So we had financial planning for everyone as well, and, and those things were very well received. Um, we, we were then fortunate enough to uh, get funding to um, have, a, uh, have a, a booklet to commemorate the closing of Piermont Refinery. Do you want to, yeah, next slide, thanks, Dave. Um, and so um, we did a number of things to bring together the memories, but one of the things that went very well, we found a group of, um, of past employees who had spent a significant part of their working life at CSR Piermont. Um, these seven guys had about 270 years of service between them. So if you weren't a 40 years servant of the company, you didn't, you didn't make it in that group. <laughs> So they were brought back and they regaled people with uh, memories, tall tales and true of what had happened um, and helped us put together some of the history of the place because it's surprising you think these things are all well documented but, but they're not as well documented as you realise. Um, and, and finally then um, we went, uh, last slide though, thanks. we went to um, a closure function at Wentworth Park where over 300 people attended. Um, there was barely a dry eye there on the night. Um, there were lots of friends um, and partners and past employees came along. It was, but I think we would like to think that uh, Piedmont Refinery, after giving 114 years of service to CSR, after giving so much to so many people who worked here through generations, and after serving our customers for 114 years, we would like to think that Piedmont Refinery went out with a fitting bang at the end. Um, so, so that's all from me. I, I, I'd just like to um, really, I'm, I'm sure the others will mention the same thing. Um, thank you for, for having us along. When you're invited to something like this, it gives you a chance to spend some time looking down memory lane. You have to go back through some of your own records and some of your own books and things like that. And when you've been lucky enough to work for an organisation like CSR Piermont, or lucky enough to work for an organisation um, like CSR, a trip down memory lane is actually a very pleasant experience. So thank you for having us. Um, and later on we'll try to answer any questions that you have. But, uh, Unfortunately, I've spotted in the audience people who know more about Piedmont than I much more. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to be careful on how we answer the question. <laughs>
in Bradford for quite a long time, 13 years there. Um, then I went to make bricks at PGH Bricks and Pavers for seven years. And then I went back to the ethanol business and finished off my career there again. So that, that just gives you a bit of an idea. But I am one of the dinosaurs that you know, stayed their whole career with CSR, so it's a, uh, but as the guy said, we had a fantastic time, you know, great opportunities and so on. So now, on to the hostel. You've probably seen a lot of these photos, you've seen it when you're walk, walking around. Um, the hostel, uh, I've got to get my notes. The um, host hostel was initially um, the Piermont Refinery Sugars Manager's residence. Right? So it was the original back in 1952. That was where the manager of this place, now Brian, unfortunately, he was the last manager. He didn't get to live in a house like that. So. But um, yeah, in 1952, it was converted into a hostel with about 10 rooms. In the next room, next one. Okay, that's a that's a, um, a aerial view. That's the block of land. That's the old hostel. This is new infill housing that you've probably seen in the back, and the infill housing on the front. Now, the infill housing on the front was just grass lawns. The infill housing at the back there was the annex. CSR built an annex with seven rooms in it, where. The, so they had overflow because they start, the training started, there were too many people there and they had to get more rooms for us. Um, as Dennis said, I think the, the hostel was originally just for the country boys. So all, all of us, Dennis was a city slicker so he didn't need any training on how to survive in the big smoke. But Brian and myself, we both came from Queensland I came from Gladstone, a little country town, before it turned into a big industrial uh, place it is. And so what they did was the hostel allowed us to get our city legs. So we were 17 year old kids from the bush, being let loose in Sydney with no parental supervision. <laughs> and so, but we did have one parental supervision, that was Mrs Wilson. <laughs> she was the housekeeper. Um, I think there's another slide there, is there? Yeah, there's a. She, she was the housekeeper, and every year she had to break in 14 17 year old kids, all from the bush, let loose in Sydney, and it was quite amazing. Mrs. Wilson broke us all in. She had a big brass bell, and when that bell went off, boy, you disappeared to your room as quick as you could. But at the end, when we all left, she cried. <laughs> so it was, um, it was, um, yeah, quite, quite, quite a, a um, yeah, experience. And not only for our year, but for every year that went on. It went on for nearly 15 years of you know, breaking in new cadets, getting them into the city, and off they went. Um, so some of the points here, the annex was built in 1959. The first woman to be accepted into the hostel was in 1980. Mm -hmm. So that, that just goes, it goes it's, yeah, you, sometimes you look back on that stuff and you think, it couldn't be right. Yeah, but it was, it was yeah, even 1980 before it was done. And then it was shut down around the same time as the whole of the Piermont complex disappeared. The hostel, by the way, was managed by the refinery manager. So not only was the refinery manager had to run all this complex, he had to look after those kids up the road too. So it was, a, was, um, was quite, quite a, a challenge for him. The building's now heritage listed, and I believe, I'm not sure, but I think it's a women's refuge now, from, from what I understand of that. So yes, it is. It is, thank you. Yeah. So it's gone the full circle there from yeah, a refuge for us kids to now the women. Um, sorry, I've got a little bit out of whack here. Oh, back then, CSR was one of the biggest, largest trainers in Australia. It was along with BHP, the Water Board, and the Electricity Commission. They were the four big trainers back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So, yeah, 
and we're, we're fortunate we were one of them. Um, I'll just go a little bit about cadets. The, what happened was when we were cadets, mechanical cadets, we went down to the workshops and we worked alongside the apprentices there, made our scribing blocks, did all that stuff, learnt, learnt to become tradesmen as well as engineers. The chemical guys who were at the hostel went to Central Lab and they did, they did their analysis of the sugars and everything. Um, next slide. Yeah, and the next one, sorry. Yeah. Now, this is a photo I found of the hostel dining room in 1962. And the boys are all there with their ties and they're sitting up very prim and proper. Um, linen tablecloth. Yeah, you can, you can just visualise the, the setup. In 1971, when we were there, that had degenerated quite a bit. We didn't wear <laughs> ties. Yeah, and we're, uh, and I, I'd say we're probably a little bit more worldly, maybe. We had the same knives and forks. <laughs> we had the same knives and forks there. Yeah. yeah, so the, um, and we had full board there, by the way. The, when we lived there, it was $14 a week full board, and that got us all our meals, our washing done, the rooms cleaned, and the only thing we had to do was make our beds. <laughs> so it was a it was fantastic back in those days that we were just looked after, you know, as far as just staying alive, you know, food wise. Um, okay, the um, us living in Piemont here, we were you know this is where we lived. We lived and breathed it in Piemont in the seventies. And if anyone's got any knowledge of what the Piermont was like in the 70s in the area outside the fence lines of the factories, it was tough, right? It was pretty rough and rough and ready. Yeah, you had to, you know, um, quite considered in your actions and your conversations because otherwise you'd end up with a black eye very, very quickly. Right? And, but lucky we were young kids and we could run fast. So. But there were three pubs in the area, the Pacific, which is now the uh, Point. Point, Point. Piemont Point, the, uh, the Duke, as we always used to call it, that was our pub, the Duke, it was considered the, about the safest in the area for us to go and drink at, which is now the Harlequin, and then the Terminus here. So, so that, they were our three pubs within you know, 40 metres of the hostel, so they were our, our drinking places. The Terminus, it was a bloodbath. Yeah, it was all tile bars, tile floors. I think they hosed it out every morning. Yeah, it was, it was yeah, if you ever went and had a beer in there, it'd be in one beer and you'd be gone again. Yeah, you wouldn't hang around. The Royal Pacific was okay at daytime, but at nighttime you were still quite, quite, uh, quite uh, cautious about where you go. So when we, we, we'd go down to the Duke and you know, occasionally we had to leg it out of there and leg it all the way back to the hostel because some one of the locals were after us with a pool cue or something like that. But, it, next slide. And as you can see now, not the same place as what we experienced in the 70s. They're very gentrified now, and very, um, very, uh, uh, yeah, safer, yeah, I would think. <laughs> Especially for you guys, you don't even have fences on the factory anymore. Um, now, on Friday nights, bearing in mind we're all young kids at the hostel, we, we, um, we were working five days a week. We went to uni Tuesday and Thursday afternoons and night times to study, but the rest of the time. So you can imagine, Friday nights, we all started looking forward to a Friday night pretty well, and and needless to say, yeah, we managed to do it pretty well, I think. The um, for us Queenslanders, when we came down here, the drinking age in Queensland was 21. So for most of us, our first le legal drink was at one of those three pubs, <laughs> and there's some of the, some of the guys who were even a bit younger, they still weren't quite 18. So one of the guys grew a mo, so he wouldn't be questioned about <laughs> whether he was 18 or not. <coughs> um, so Friday nights, we'd finish work, we'd fly out to the hostel, have a shower, and we'd be down the pub 
but we only had a limited window because Mrs. Wilson was cooking dinner on Friday nights. So we had to go down to the pub, scroll about three schooners, and then back for dinner. And then after dinner, we'd go back down and we'd play pool and generally have a good time. Dinner on a Friday night was always a hot and spicy meal. I think she just used to save it up and that Friday night was an extra uh, sprinkle of curry or whatever went into them. So the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the Melbourne truth there, and I could probably, this is probably a little you know, insensitive about what it was like. In the Melbourne truth, there was an article called Heart Bar. And I don't know if any of you remember back in those days it was called. And Heart Balm was a sexual advice column with a tongue in cheek for the, in the 70s. Right? The, the, all these stories, there are Dor Dorothy Dix type questions, you know, so, yeah. And all the answers were written as if the Arch Archbishop had written the answer. And it was like, you must tell your mother at once or something <laughs> like, like this. So, so we used to have the readings from the as one of the little sidelines in the in the, um, in the dining room for dinner. <laughs> the, uh, and needless to say, people would be rolling around the floors. When we went back to the pub at night time, the, it was always a challenge table. The, the pool table was a challenge table. That means if you won, you stayed on and the next per person paid for the game and, you, and you'd always play for a beer. And occasionally, when the locals decided we'd won too many games, there was quite a judicious loss of game <laughs> to let the locals have the table back again. Because we, back in those days, we were, you know, we were pretty good at our pool too. We, we were uh, yeah, quite competitive. So yeah, in the end, we worked out, we were pretty quick learners, and I think that was one of the selection criteria CSR had for us. We could learn pretty quickly that if we beat this local, we're going to get a black eye. So we, we, um, the, we, we used to have a strategic loss. Back in those days, beers were 60 cents and a packet of cigarettes were 40 cents. So, and, and as Dennis said, we got paid to go to university. So we all had, we all had money to be able to afford to have a drink and, and and so on. We all had our cars. We all bought cars. You know, it was, we, we were very, very, very lucky people for that. And given all this, the Friday nights and everything, we still managed to pass our exams. We all got our degree. And you know, but I think there was some good luck and good management in those ones. <laughs> but we had a good time, and it was a fantastic year. And the friendships we got out of that were just second to none. Brian and myself and two other guys we shared after we left the hostel, what happened that everyone would get together in the hostel and towards the end of the year you'd form groups and you'd go off and you'd rent a house over near the uni in New South Wales and and Brian and myself and two other guys, we shared a house for five years together. So, you know, it was it's and we just, and there were many C, what we called CSR houses scattered around the eastern suburbs with all cadets living in them and going to uni. So it was, you know, it was a very, uh, very close, close group. Um, from from no, back in those days, it's about 15 or 20 of us out of 1971 who have stayed particularly close friends, playing golf on Thursdays now and that sort of stuff. And then there's a bigger group who we're not close friends, but you know, when we cross paths again, it's just like yesterday. So the, the friendships were really good. And one of those things was, as um, Dennis put up the slide for our 50-year reunion, yeah, we had 40-odd people there at that reunion. And it was just, you know, we, we had a great time. Um, one of the other things is the, one of the, yeah, sorry, that's, yeah, the ongoing. So we celebrate our 50 years. Quite often we'll all catch up for lunch or some other thing. And we also have what we call the CSR Past Employees Association. Now we have, it's called the CSR Alumni or the Past Employees Association. We have uh, 300 members, 300 retired CSR people in the association and there's about 200 active. The What we call the inactive are the ones who, guys who are 
they're all retired, too old, and they like to get their newsletters and that sort of stuff and stay in touch. But the there's 200 people who we have luncheons, we have harbour cruises, we have golf days. You know, we they, there's a whole series of functions. We also have a group, a chapter in Brisbane as well, and they have functions up there as well. So it's a um, it's a quite a uh, you know, large organisation that's, and that just goes to show how big CSR was and all those people have drawn from it. Um, and also recently we did a walk through Piermont and we had about, I don't know, 40 odd people here and we did a down memory lane walk and it was for some of the people who hadn't been back here for since the 90s, it was such an eye opener for them. So it was a, that was a good thing. Right, so the distillery. I'm just going to touch on uh, three things on this because I'm not sure how much people, I, th I think people know a fair bit about the sugar refinery and what happened here. Up at the distillery, they, every people know there was a distillery there, but what actually went on up there is there were three basic main parts to it, apart from the molasses coming in from the sugar mills in Queensland, but we made ethanol, we made carbon dioxide, which I'm not sure how many people really knew about that. And there was a cooperage and that was just down here. So, so next slide, Dennis. The, so with the ethanol, we made three distinct types of ethanol. We made rum, the inner circle. I think everyone's probably heard of the legendary CSR inner circle rum. And if you haven't, you should taste it, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> we also made other potable spirits like vodkas and um, many of the Southern Comfort knockoffs and stuff like that. And then we made a lot of industrial ethanol. Industrial ethanol is like all in those 44 gallon drums, bulk containers. Um, methylated spirits is an industrial. So when you see methylated spirits, that was all made at the distillery here. And methylated means it's just had a poison put into it so you can't drink it, or if you do, you end up a bit loopy. So that, and you don't pay, when, when any of these products are being methylated, you don't pay excise on the alcohol content of it. It's only potable spirits, which is rum and potable, that you pay excise. Down the bottom here, there's a range of inner circle rums there all from 33 UP, which is like standard uh, vodka strength, that sort of stuff, up to one OP, up to 33 OP. 33 OP is 75% pure alcohol. So it, it's not rocket fuel, but, it's, uh, <laughs> but it makes the plum puddings really light up, I can tell you. The, um, yeah, some of the potable spirits we made here were Neutral cane spirit, which goes into a lot of uh, you know, RTDs, you know, you, the, the cans with the vodka and orange and all that. Well, it's just a neutral cane spirit with no vodka in it, it's a, which is the same thing anyway. Chemically, it's identical, but it uh, goes into there. We used to export a lot to Japan for the sake, making they used to put a lot of it in sake. Um, as I said before, there's a southern comp. Uh, Southern Style Spirit, which was a Southern Comfort knockoff. Um, industrial Spirits, I think I, I've been through that with you. Okay, CO2. When we started with the molasses, which came from the sugar mill and from the refinery here as part of their refining process, we would ferment the molasses and for every tonne of ethanol you made, you made a tonne of CO2. And that CO2 was turned into liquid CO2, dry ice. We had a dry ice machine up there making dry ice for those who remember the, the dry ice. And also um, Snowflow, which was a new product that they developed when snap frozen vegetables came in. So this was how they snap froze all the, the vegetables with that. The, um, you know, we had big um, liquid CO2 trucks that delivered the CO2 around the place, sold the blocks of dry ice. I don't know if you remember the, at picnics, you'd have the, or company picnics, you'd have the big Paul's uh, green canvas bag and there was dry ice in it to keep all your ice creams frozen. 
Well, that's what the dry eye and it all came from here. So next one, Dennis. Okay, the cooperage. I just wanted to spend a bit of time here because people probably know the cooperage down here, but how does it connect with the, the Piermont complex? Right. The cooperage was there to repair 44 gallon drums, timber casks and timber vats. Now all the rum was put in, now you have to apologise, these two photos here, I pinched them off the internet to, to give, give you an idea of what it was like, but this is exactly what it was like. Right? <coughs> so the guys would repair casks, because if they leaked, the rum would leak out and the, make a mess and we'd lose product. So they'd keep the cars. The 44 gallon drums, and if you remember that uh, photo of the industrial alcohol before with all the orange drums, well CSR drums back in the day were a, a real maroon red color, and recently they changed it to orange. So, But when you refilled all the drums, you had to make sure that the insides were clean to make sure there was no um, yeah, you know, no impurities in it for the for the alcohol. You had to make sure the chines or the rims of the drums were solid, and they had to be painted nice and shiny because the customer didn't want a banged up drum sent to his premises. So, so we used to have a um, uh, a whole drum refurbishing set up at the cooperage, and refurbish all the forty four gallon drums as well as refurbishing the casks and the big timber vats. Um, for those who have been down to the cooperage building here and gone in on the ground floor, as you go past the little cafe and you go down the hallway, there's a display area of the old drum hoist. Now the cooperage used to be six stories high and there was a big hoist that was on chains that went up and that's how they moved the drums from one floor to the other and, and stored them on different, different floors. Now, the 44 gallon drums, this was small compared to the, the, the cooperage floor would be double this size. And they could get a 44 gallon drum and get it on its edge and spin it and it would go on its edge over to the corner over there and there'd be a guy waiting over there to catch it and stacking them. And that's how they moved them. There was a guy taking them off the hoist and they'd just spin them and they were so good at spinning them and they'd just go straight across. They'd never go out this way or that way. And, and that was a standard process. So if you... Uh, yeah, the... Uh, yeah, you see that, that that those two photos there, the three photos are, are actually uh, distillery photos. That's one of the rum casks. The bottom one here is a cooper, and you can see up against the wall there. There all is uh, um, the tools that you uh, shape the wood with. It's gone. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and they use the same sort of things doing the spokes of wheels and stuff like that when they're making the wheels to shape them. So they'd shape them up. And um, then the other one there was uh, part of the distillation process where all the instrumentation was there. What's that? Oh yeah, that, now, these, are some, these are wooden vats. And the, these are metal bands going around the, the vat to hold all the wood staves together to, and that's where all the rum was stored. So when the rum was made, it was made out of a pot still, and I think it was something like a, you know, 400 gallons or something like that of each batch, and it go into a small, tim small timber one, and then the laboratory would test it, and everyone would smell it. We all became quite professional at smelling rum and, and grading it. And then, depending on what rum it was, it was then pumped into these bigger vats to be stored for two years before we could sell it. So, because back in the day, rum had to be in wood for two years to be sold. And it's, as I said, the, uh, they're all steel drums, those ones there. So, yeah, next, that, that was the distillery. No, next one, yeah, that one, that. Um, one of the things I just wanted to go through with you is the, um, the fire protection systems at the distillery. Because as you can imagine, 
there was an enormous number, volume of stored alcohol up there that was, um, just go through, I'm just, there's a, try the next one. That's the, oh sorry, here you go. That's the Cooper, it's just a drum voice, sorry I missed that one. Next one, Dennis. Uh, uh, next one, yeah. Okay, so this is looking up on the hill, looking back towards Anzac Bridge. This vat here, which was vat 57, one vat had a million litres of eth ethanol in it. So you can imagine the fire protection of all these other tanks and then all the warehouses down below, it was vital we got that right. right. So, the, um, so do you want to go back a step? Yep. <coughs> so fire protection systems, it was all the standard handheld extinguishers, all different types, CO2, dry powder, foam, hose reels, hydrants, a lot of thermal monitoring, you know, just like these monitors in the roof. Had a direct line to the fire brigade, as you can imagine, was pretty important. And we had two foam systems. The aerofoam system protected the vats. And what that, next one. This is Bowman Street. I'm going back to the cooperage, sorry, I was just getting ahead, ahead of myself on one slide. This is Bowman Street, looking from down at the old Piermont Bridge, looking up the hill, the gatehouse is on the left up there. And as you can see, back then, and it's not nothing like this now, they're all big concrete walls. And the cooperage was on the left, and the bridge across the top there was where the steam pipes, the molasses pipes and the drums from the cooperage would go up in the hoist, roll over that bridge and into the distillery. So the cooperage was on this side of the road and the, and the distillery was on the other. So, so that, that, was, that was the main services corridor. So just go, uh, where am I? I'm lost now. Am I going forward or? Yeah, uh, try going forward. Yeah, okay. So what we had here with the, with the uh, aerophone there were little uh, points, uh, just, there was one, just here. What it is, there was a pipe going up to the top of the tank and what it did was it uh, pumped foam <coughs> in onto the surface of the alcohol in the top of the tank. And the idea was if it was on fire, it would just smother the fire and put it out. So, so that, that was the aerophone system which was to protect all the tanks. Next one. Oh, yeah, Dennis alluded to this when he was trying to get to work one day. There was someone about my size, he was probably about this height back in those days too. We were testing the, the high-ex foam system and we had a little compound up the top there where we uh, supposedly run in a, a, a measured amount of foam and just check the system was working all right. Well, this one time, I was in charge of it all. The, um, the message didn't get back because the guy with the radio who was supposed to turn the diesel pump off was too close to it and couldn't hear it. And so it kept running and it went up and over, filled the whole street there between these two high walls and the phone was that deep, semi-trailers couldn't even drive through it. <laughs> and you can imagine phone, you drive into it, it's like a snowstorm, you can't, you can't see it. Yeah, more than that far in front of you. So it was a, uh, needless to say, a, a little bit of fun trying to explain that one away. So uh, back, go back one. Yeah. Now the uh, the hot and the so I just wanted to talk about the high foam. It was a um, that was used. So we talk, had the aerophone to protect the vats. High foam protected the warehouses like this. So the idea was if there was a fire in there, you just pump this. High, high, high X was high expansion foam. We'd just fill the warehouse full of foam and it'd smother the fire. And it was very effective. There was one fire here after, after my time, but it, there was a fire there and it worked quite, quite well and put everything out. The, one of the things we used to do was the, to, whenever we tested the foam system, we would get everyone in the factory to go and try and walk through it. And because it was, yeah, it was, it was like a snowstorm. You had 
you, you totally lost orientation of where you were, what you were doing, what you were tripping over. So, and you had to put your head in your shirt to break the bubbles down so you could breathe, so you wouldn't get all the foam up your face. So it was quite a good training exercise to get people to, to, um, to, <coughs> yeah, to be able to have to go in and then, then you'd use a for, a, just a hose to break the foam down and it just broke down and it was fine again. So I think that's it. That's about me for the day. That's all I wanted to do is just give you a bit of an insight into the, the uh, hostel and a little bit about the distillery that maybe people didn't know about. So. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, David, Brian, and Dennis. Just amazing. So, we don't have a lot of time, but perhaps we just take a few questions and then we'll break for um, some snacks and wine. Did you source any of your sugar from the Pacific Islands? Uh, I can't. Uh... So the question is, did we source any sugar from the Pacific Islands? I, I guess um, CSR for a number of years, John, I think we were right, um, operated mills in Fiji at least. Yeah, yes. yeah, my, almost all the sugar here came from the northern rivers of New yeah. South Wales because the ships were too small to, yeah. to, to get up those rivers, were too small to do export jobs, so most of it just came straight down the coast. Yeah, and in, in the later years when we had a 15,000 tonne ship, it generally came from the from uh, either northern New South Wales or Queensland. Yeah, or from yeah. Lucinda. Yeah. yeah. CSR did uh, source sugar from the, what was then called the South Pacific Sugar Mills until it was nationalised by the Fijian government in an arbitration case led by Lord... Uh, sorry, I've gone blank on his name. He was the... from Britain. Lord Denning. Lord Denning. Thank you. Yeah, yes. yeah certainly that, that sugar was sold um, both in Australia and overseas as well. Yeah. So that was part of the, of the CSR sugar industry. Yeah. Uh, I've got two questions. One new gentleman be able to answer me. Was this hall the hall that was used for the children's Christmas party? No, it's the rum store, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so, no, I don't recall a children's Christmas party being used in this hall. This was actually the main office. Um, so, in the later years, anyway. Um, 51, 52 I'm talking about, 1952. Oh uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I remember that year really well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think my mum and dad do. <laughs> but the the reason I ask is, I, I'm not sure whether it was here or was it the community centre where I had my first children's Christmas party here and my last Christmas party uh, with... Uh, CSRO. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't, big room down. There, yeah. there were certainly down a number of big rooms. I mean, yeah. in later years, um, I know we had, uh, we used areas in the warehouse. We had an open day. We had family days, things like that. But I'm not sure. Did they use the, uh, the community centre? No, I don't think so. No. Uh, not to, not to my understanding. I'm sure it was up this end somewhere. I can't just pinpoint where it was. Anyway, the other question was, I always understood that the, um, there's three, eight cottages on John Street that were used for uh, uh, interstate engineers. Is that right? John Street, there's some... Um, yeah. the, uh, it depends which part, part of the, the history we're talking about here. The, there's a lot of uh, different um, thinking applied to those houses from you know pe employees here to then being reserved for interstate people and so on but each year or every five years or something that changed and so it's quite hard to put a you know specific thing on which year you're talking about the, but yes there probably were
We'll have just one more question because time is marching on. Thank you very much. It's been a very entertaining uh, afternoon. And Jim Schwell, Porter's Liquor, Piermont. Our bottle shop actually holds the license that used to belong to CSR in order to distill all the things that you've been talking about this evening. Uh, are you able to give us a little bit more information about Inner Circle, please? Why it was called Inner Circle? Yep. I, I can certainly do that. It, it, C, CSR made a lot of rum. Most of the rum was sold to other uh, blenders, pe people who bottled and blend. And they went out in things like Naval Crown, Frigate, you, know, you name it, they were heaps of um, different rums that were sold as bulk. But what there was, there was a, the, the good rums, and as I said, when it was done, it was small batches, when they, a really good one came along, it was put into the special vats and <coughs> there was called the director special and the general manager's reserve, <laughs> which were, you couldn't buy them, they weren't for sale, they were only for customers and employees and stuff as, as gifts. But in 19, I've got it here and I forgot to talk about it, the, um, Okay, uh, in 1968, the CSR decided to release a rum called Inner Circle to the market. Before that, it was already bottled and, and, uh, and coveted by CSR employees. And if you ever got a bottle of Inner Circle rum back in the early days, you were very lucky. So in 1968, CSR sold the rum business to Bundy Rum and the industrial alcohol from Bundy was marketed by CSR. So there was a, 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 a um, yeah, split up of the, uh, the, the volumes there. When it, uh, after 68, it changed, the Inner Circle brand changed hands many times and there was a uh, some Sydney to Hobart sailors, I believe, um, decided that on the sailing down to Hobart one time, they, they wanted to reinvigorate the, uh, the Inner Circle brand because it had gone defunct. So they then built a distillery up at Bean Lee, you know, the old Bean Lee rum distillery that was bought and made Inner Circle rum with Malcolm Campbell, who was the production manager from the distillery back in my day. And he was responsible for making the, um, the, uh, the rum. So he had a very good knowledge of that. And I know David Porter's here, he could probably uh, even give a, a way more succinct answer to that, the, to, uh, to what it is. But, but what it is now, the Inner Circle rum is still being made up at Bean Lee and it's owned by a company called Vop Beverages, and it's still 100% Australian owned. So that's the, that's the story of, quick story of it. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to stop now for um, something to eat and some wine. And yes, please, but please quite quickly because it's now 6.30. I used to work in the distillery at okay. the top of the day and it took a circular boat out all the way up. So I want to see what the place looks like before the taxes are ready. Uh, I have a series of photos. Okay. Many interest. Thank photos here. Thanks, David. Okay. So we're going to stop right now, but please feel free to come and ask any questions individually. So we'll be here for a little while anyway. Thank you.